I'm very pleased uh, to be here. It's the, actually the first time that I am uh, in Houston, uh, speaking engagement in Houston. It's a wonderful uh, city. It's a wonderful um, uh, place here, Vargo's Restaurant. At first I thought it was a uh, department of the Houston Zoo, but it's actually <laughs> just, just a nice place to be. Um, I, uh, my, my topic today is the cultural cloak of the state, which brings me directly to Walter Block, who uh, more or less uh, took away my subject from me talking about all these things, and also taking away the justification uh, for me. So I had the urge to spring up and then rip the microphone away from, from him, say, stop, Walter, that's my subject. But then he said, and he brought up the example with his wife, and he said, well, you have no right to prevent competition. Right? <laughs> and if, 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 if I, so it's good to know that I can compete with you as far as your wife is concerned. <laughs> But he brought up another subject too, right? This, this uh, stealing terms and stealing, um, stealing uh, expressions, and so on. So, uh, therefore, you get from me uh, now, as a, from, from a German, a hearty howdy. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll, so I'll, I'll still start to, to compliment, supplement a little bit what Walter Block has said. So, um, I'll first uh, go on defining uh, my, my terms. Uh, uh, after all, I've, I'm a university professor, so you 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 get what you asked for. And uh, so the coercive state and, and culture, and then uh, I'll talk about uh, the uh, the reasons why the state intervenes into into the culture and tries to obtain a cultural cloak, and how it, uh, the state goes about it and why he goes about it the way he does it does it, and then we'll talk a little bit about the consequences that result from it. Okay, so first of all, we have uh, yeah. Uh, the word uh, coercive state. What is a coercive state? It's actually very nice to, to, to say this. Um, I might think it's, it's an oxymoron. Uh, 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 not an oxymoron, it's a pleonasm. Uh, uh, isn't any state coercive? Well, I mean, did, again, it always defend, uh, depends on how you define terms. You can define a state in such a way. Uh, it's, it's, it's a government um, uh, as it uh, operates based on right reason and so on. Uh, then libertarians would be tempted to say, well, okay, then we wouldn't have any government at all, so it's still, I mean, how, how can this be? Um, but the crucial element in any case is indeed uh, the distinction between governing services, and we do have governing services in various private and, and, and public institutions. We have governing, uh, governing services, for example, in condominiums. We have uh, governing uh, services in uh, sports clubs and so on. So you need people who are organizing, setting up things, making decisions for a larger body uh, of people. And as Walter Block has pointed out, and that's, of course, the libertarian plumb line, the crucial question is always, is it voluntary or not? That is, in particular, uh, are you a, a voluntary member of the association that is being governed by this government or not? And the problem that we have nowadays is that we cannot opt out, right? You can say, okay, no longer subscribe to the government services of the federal government in Washington, D.C. And I would very much love to opt out of the government services of the French government, but, yeah, we're still further away from this. Okay, so the crucial element here is uh, the coerciveness. Uh, we are we're forced to consume these services. And again, the question is, is it a true service? Uh, so the crucial element is the coercive element. And co coerciveness uh, means, well, um, uh, taking away our property against our will. Right? Uh, the government uh, can exercise its coerciveness in uh, two or three ways. Right? It can take away resources from us in the way of taxation, uh, sometimes also in a less visible form, in the f form of inflation, right? Then the purchasing power of, of the money uh, unit is diminished. But it can also order us to do things and order us to behave, interact with other people in certain ways. And in that respect, too, then, it infringes on our property rights. And right? it uh, takes away some liberty uh, of, uh, uh, at the margin that we have. Uh, whether I, 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 I marry, I'm married to a woman or to a man and government orders me, okay, in the name of equality and uh, fairness, you've got to be married at least once uh, one year to a man or something, uh, then that's definitely an infringement on my property rights. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, the, the coerciveness must always be seen in this context. Uh, now, the second term that we have here is culture. And uh, when we think about culture, we attempted to uh, 
uh, have in mind uh, predominantly the uh, the arts, um, paintings, uh, literature, uh, and so on. And that's certainly a very important part uh, of, uh, of of culture, but it's not the only part of culture. We must have a very comprehensive view of uh, uh, the meaning of culture, and especially if we want to understand uh, government intervention in this field. So to culture also belongs, for example, the, the sciences. Right? And of course, I say this in some self-interest. Right? I'm a cultural producer. I'm not just a mean economist interested in material things, but uh, this cultural cultural work. Uh, but more largely also uh, consumption, the kind of products that we consume. And why do we uh, have a restaurant facility set up in, uh, in this way? Uh, we could have been built in many other ways. The, way, the reason why it's set up in these ways with this nice architecture of uh, uh, wood and, and, and glass construction, and it's very airy and so on, then we have a kind of a zoo around. Uh, this is an expression of, of culture. Uh, this is a reflection of uh, what those who run this restaurant and, and, and uh, think about uh, life and uh, what they think about how their customers uh, uh, see themselves in their relation to, to these things. So we have consumption and production is part of the uh, of the culture. Production itself is part of the culture. How do we produce things? Uh, very different ways to go about it. Um, of course, from an economic point of view, we might say, okay, uh, it's ultimately uh, a question of profitability. We choose one way of producing things rather than another because it's more profitable uh, than other things. But yeah, and while this is true, uh, even in production, things are not quite as, as straightforward as, as this. As everybody uh, here knows, who um, uh, has to hire people. If you are not dealing with completely primitive manual labor, uh, some, something more sophisticated, then other things come into play. Now, the personal preferences of the, the people you are working with uh, come into play. The way they uh, they view the world, they view their social relationships, and so on. You've got to take account of this. Uh, and it will therefore be also be reflected in the way you go about things. So production is too a reflection of uh, values, preferences of uh, of the individuals involved in production. Family. Uh, water block brought this up. Uh, sorry, it's, it's impossible just to talk about other things than water because water pretty much covered the ground. Right? So I'll not talk about language because you went so much detail there. Yeah, but family. Um, uh, what is what is by the way what is a family? Well, these days it's, it's a good question, right? In former uh, about 20 years ago or so, still it was pretty straightforward. You have a man, you have a woman, you have a couple of, of bimbo uh, bambinis, right? as, as the uh, Italians say. Uh, and, and these days it could be anything, right? It could be two men and, and a dog, and uh, <laughs> two women, three women. Uh, I mean, next year, a man and a monkey. I don't know what. <laughs> I, I had to think about this monkey thing, right? Uh, because Walter munch, mentioned uh, the, the AIDS virus, right? So how how does how does the virus get into? Well, okay. <laughs> social relations in general, okay. Very important field of social relations is, of course, production. Again, right? Uh, business firms and so on. But uh, I mentioned clubs, uh, associations, but also the public sphere. Uh, how people interact in the streets uh, is, is very different from one country to another. Uh, as all of you know who have, uh, well, uh, gone to other places, not necessarily Canada, but um, let's say uh, Japan or China or even in Europe, uh, is a big difference, for example, already between Germany and, uh, and Spain, how people interact on the streets and so on. It's not only because it's colder in Germany, but uh, there's other, other things that come into play too. Um, population. What's the composition of the population? Uh, homogeneous population. What's the size of the population? How many different groups? Uh, what, is, what are their relationships and so on? It's an expression of the culture. What are the languages that they speak? Um, we have uh, the setting up of cities. The, um, the way cities are built, how they are organized. Uh, uh, of course, again, we see big differences uh, today between. Uh, European cities and, uh, and American cities. Uh, most Europeans are deceived when they when they come for the first time to the U.S. Uh, because they have these, these great images of, of New York and so on. New York is a distinct uh, cultural product, uh, and uh, San Francisco as well. And so it's a common saying, right? In the U.S., you have three cities: you have New York, you have San Francisco, and all the rest is Cleveland. 
Okay. Um, but of course, you could say similar things about Europe. There's also a certain type of a European city, uh, the way it is built up and so on. But again, so the point is, the way we, we do, we go about these things, the way we build cities, uh, we organize them, is an expression of the culture. Uh, same thing about uh, regional uh, development, uh, how our streets build, how our settlements uh, uh, created within the country, how is, uh, does this articulate with city dwellings and so on. It's all an part of the culture. Then, of course, in our day, environment. What is the relationship between human beings and, well, their, their natural environment, uh, not only as, as factors of production, but more generally. So, again, the way we view these things and we, we go about this, we, we make decisions about our uh, uh, about our uh, natural environment is a reflection of the culture. And finally, religion, uh, probably the most fundamental factor of all, is also, of course, a very, very uh, important and fundamental part of culture. So we're talking here about a, a, a huge bag. And as we know, the state today is present in all these fields. Um, state runs the arts, runs the sciences. Fortunately, in the U.S., you're very blessed. You still have private universities uh, you have uh, uh, private research. You even have private artists. I uh, try to go about this. Uh, well, okay, they're private artists also in, in Europe, but they almost do this with a bad conscience. I'm always fascinated in, in the U.S. when I sometimes see TV shows and their advertisements, art, artists, painters in particular, uh, promoting uh, their work, and it's just wonderful. It, it's, it's great. Architecture, by the way, too, is an art. Uh, at least I, I think uh, about it this way. And it, it's for profit, and that's uh, in the US, and it's a, it's a very good thing. Uh, but so the, the government is present in virtually all countries, more so in Europe uh, than the US, in the arts and in the sciences. Uh, the government, of course, is present in consumption, uh, tells us which uh, things to produce. Right? Some products are not healthy enough, others might be too healthy, uh, dangerous, uh, uh, morally offensive. Uh, and so on. Uh, the government also is present in production, tells us how to produce things, and uh, here two aspects come, come into play, of course, uh, environmental aspects, but also uh, social relations. You cannot just produce how you wish. No, you've got to produce in the right way. So in, in some cases, the most flagrant example is the pr promotion by government of, of labor unions. Um, in the U.S., as you know, uh, we have uh, quotas, a very strong move toward establishment of, of quotas of certain types of workers, males, females, handicapped, non-handicapped, uh, different ethnicity, ethnicities, and so on. In Europe, this is still less pronounced, but we are moving very strongly in, into the same uh, direction. Uh, family, of course, right? government has been in place for a long time. More recently in the U.S. Uh, than, than in Europe, and less strongly in the U.S. Uh, traditionally than in Europe, but ever more strongly so uh, in the past few years. And again, we, we've talked about gay marriage. It's the most flagrant example. And of course, well, so uh, gay marriage is the natural outcome of uh, uh, having government in the marriage business at all. It's just a very natural consequence. As soon as the government has the authority to define what a marriage is, and it has the authority to, uh, by virtue of its, well, uh, uh, authority to can marriage licenses. Yeah. Well, then, of course, the government can just make up its mind and make a different decision, say, okay, well, now the union between a monkey and, uh, and a pheasant is a marriage. <laughs> so. And how, well, so this just, it's just, uh, it's, it's a full, completely fruitless debate because it's just quibbling about words. Right? If they say, okay, we are using this word from now on in this encompassing uh, sense, right? Any union that we decide is, uh, that we, we think should be called this way, we do call marriage, then of course there's nothing to argue about. That's how they do it, and that's fine. Um, and it's, again, it's a natural consequence of having um, this institution in the marriage business at all. Uh, city regional planning, of course, uh, omnipresent uh, population. Right? Government runs uh, uh, very expensive programs, very encompassing pro programs designed to create a certain type of population, right, right proportion between different eth ethnicities. Uh, therefore, very interested in questions of immigration and so on, but also in population growth. I find this very interesting. I, I sometimes wonder whether uh, all these uh, people running the uh, population offices and population bureaus 
of the federal governments uh, in the world, but uh, they have all been cattle breeders before. Because that's, that's the kind of mental uh, equipment that you need to have in order to do good population policy. Ultimately, you must look at human beings as cattle. Right? It's just, okay, well, we don't have enough of these and the cows don't give enough. So what can we do with some different nourishment or you know, uh, food or uh, they need more uh, uh, more stabs or more whips or uh, more sugar? Um, you know, in our day, of course, well, so the, the, the principle is the same. We don't, of course, whip them directly. We don't give them sugar, but we, we do other things. We give um, uh, mar- uh, uh, maternity leave, paternity leave, and all these things, uh, which are, again based on and result from a very mechanistic view of how human beings make choices, how they go about uh, offspring and so on, uh, you, you treat them in the same way as you would treat your, your cow or your sheep. Uh, the environment, uh, okay, it's, it's not necessary to, to say anything about this, and clearly it's, it's the, probably the most uh, uh, terrible threat to our liberty today, uh, government uh, endeavor to um, uh, well, protect the environment differently from what it would have been uh, if the choice were left to people on the free market. And uh, finally, uh, the example that I gave, religion, of course, here again, the government is very strongly present, and virtually all religions are under very tight uh, government control and have been under tight government control. The only exception is, again, and bless you, uh, the United States. And, and I hope very much for you that it will stay uh, this way. There are, again, as you know, tendencies in the past few years uh, by the present administration to, to change this and to bring the government also in the religion business. So uh, why, why all this? Why is the government present in uh, all these fields? Um, uh, the, uh, the catchword here and what I, we need to, to keep in mind is that the, the state is a cultural parasite. Okay, state is a cultural parasite. It thrives on uh, a culture that is by and large produced and uh, been created independently of his own efforts. So he has a parasitic uh, relationship with cultural uh, production. And the reason is, uh, ultimately, uh, that the, the government is under the constant need to justify its uh, activities and to hide its uh, naked power. Uh, as we said, so it, in a way it follows from the definition of uh, the coercive state itself. The state is coercive. Its defining element is the violation of property rights, taking away uh, property from other people without their consent. And if the government just went about this in a straightforward way and said, okay, uh, well, give me all your money because I said so, that uh, would not be very charming. Uh, so we would not have, uh, I mean, uh, some people maybe uh, would find this maybe sexy or cool, uh, but uh, there would not too, be too many of them, right? not especially, of course, in this group, but uh, <laughs> I, I guess even in the more general population would not be too many people who would find this uh, sexy or cool. And uh, because they know it, uh, they have to, well, seek for justification. They have to seek for a cover. They have to play on the illusion that their activity is something else but naked power. And therefore, we have this very uh, very nice phrase of the cultural cloak. Culture, or the, the presence of, of the government in culture, is nothing but a cloak. Uh, it's a cover for uh, uh, its, uh, its true nature uh, to hide the, uh, the fact that the government intervention is, in fact, naked power. It is expropriation. Uh, subjection of uh, some individuals by other individuals. And of course, this cultural presence or the parasitic uh, nature of the government is in strict proportion to the ambition and to the presence of the government in all fields of society and of the economy. Uh, the, the stronger your ambitions are, the, the more encompassing your, your activities, well, the, the stronger is the cover that, the, that you need, the more uh, diversified and varied is this cover that you need. So how does the government go about this? Um, The the important point here is uh, that the government must go about it in a roundabout way in order to uh, address the fundamental problem from the point of view of government, which is the problem of authority. 
we'll go over this step, uh, about this step by step. First of all, we consider government intervening directly without this roundabout uh, way. Uh, let's say the government just said, okay, um, Christianity is out of date. This is, uh, is not very suitable uh, way to, to, uh, to think about, uh, about God and so on. And we, uh, uh, from now on, uh, everybody has to believe in the goddess, whatever, whatever the goddess uh, water or, so, or the goddess microphone. Um, what, whatever, so it could be anything. This wouldn't fly, and we all know it wouldn't uh, fly, because, well, if you just come ahead as, as one individual and as one institution, be it ever so prestigious, and say, well, you've got all to change your mind about uh, this thing about which you thought uh, in a certain way before, it would not be convincing. Would, the government would not find its uh, support of the population. The support of the population is, of course, important because as far as sheer numbers is concerned, government is always a minority, or always a very small minority. So they need support. In order to get, therefore, uh, support for uh, uh, their cultural parasitism, uh, they need to engage in political production. Okay? Uh, now, some of you, again, might think that that's a contradiction in terms, so that is an oxymoron. Right? Political production, how can that be? Well, uh, that is, of course, true, but uh, the problem disappears if we consider that production does not only concern goods, also concerns bads. Okay? You can produce a bad. And that's what they're doing. So ultimately what they want to do is to expropriate people. Right? That's the ultimate goal. And now the way to do it is a production process. Uh, and again, the, the main problem, the main ob intermediate objective of the political production process is to gain sufficient support. Right? So you have one step back. You need to produce support in order to be able to expropriate. How do you, do, how do you go about creating support? Well, you must work on the media. I must uh, uh, work on people who, who publish opinion and, uh, and who make opinion, express opinions, and so on. Try to influence them. So uh, one step back in the production chain. And for those of you who know Austrian economics, of course, you, you see immediately that we have here roundabout production. And, uh, so the art for, for a government is, again, at each, uh, with each uh, advancement of its own economic power, to begin economic production at an earlier uh, phase, at an earlier level, in order to influence the, uh, the, final, the final product. Now, the same thing applies in the case of uh, uh, intervention in the, in the culture. Government needs to engage in political production here, here too. And here it encounters the problem of authority. Right? Who defines how things how cultural things are uh, to be seen. Who defines the state of the art and the sciences? Who <laughs> defines the state of the arts? Uh, who defines what are uh, what is the good religion? What is the bad religion? Who defines what are uh, the envir environmental threats that we face, and so on? And right, so we have here the, the question of of truth and, and falsehood. And ultimately, therefore, the ultimate. Uh, phase in, in, in political production necessarily concerns the sciences and the arts. And therefore, uh, it is very correct uh, to, to perceive the sciences and the arts as the most eminent aspects of culture. And it is so, as we see now, because of their political roles, very important political role. It's in the arts that uh, truth is expressed, more or less uh, beautifully, in films, uh, literature, and so on. And it's in, in the sciences that the truth is, is analyzed. So the government, if it wants to impose its vision uh, on cultural affairs, has to seize the arts uh, and, and uh, the sciences where we have the authorities, uh, authorities on these questions. So again, it's important to, not to define, um, not to confuse uh, the two different meanings of the word authority. Authority can be somebody who wields political power. That's the, the way we use the word authority in political language. But more generally speaking, an authority is, um, uh, is a person who has um, the ability, when he's recognized as having the ability to, to define truth. Um, as a scientist, as, a, as an artist, and so on. So government needs to co-opt the authorities, needs to co-opt the elites in the arts and the sciences. And here we have uh, the reason why government uh, has taken particular care to well, co-op uh, to, to run universities, to run schools, 
because that's the way to um, get under control those who define truth and falsehood in these, uh, these matters. Then the que- question is, why do the authorities consent? Uh, it's a different question. Why do intellectuals, why do artists consent to this game? It's a rather stupid thing. Why do they play with, uh, with people who just want to wield naked power? Well, and here again, we have a rather unpleasant feature of, of human nature. Well, Walter mentioned competition before, right? The scientists and artists are also in competition with others. So an alliance with the government can be a very convenient way just to, to get rid of all these nasty competitors. A uh, flagrant example was uh, uh, the rise of the power to the Bolsheviks. Right? We brought this entirely new uh, uh, movement in, uh, in the arts uh, to the fore. Um, uh, writers like Maxim Gorky and uh, uh, painters, uh, sculptors and so on. Uh, and that was taken at the time uh, as a proof that socialism goes in hand with cultural, with uh, artistic innovation. Ludwig von Mises pointed out in 1922 already, so just a couple of years after the Bolshevik coup, that what was really going on was just that one part of the uh, cultural uh, producers, through their alliance with the government, were crowding out all other competitors. So, because what they were doing was new right now, there was the, the uh, false impression that socialism and uh, state intervention is inherently innovative. Right? But that as, as time would go on, these people would just enshrine their vision of, uh, of things, how, uh, what, what uh, beautiful paintings, what beautiful sculpture and so on is, into law, and would therefore stifle uh, artistic uh, innovation, artistic work. And that's exactly what has happened. Right? So the only innovation came at the time of the Bolshevik coup. After this, uh, uh, socialist art has been, has been barren. What are the consequences? Well, the consequences, of course, as we know, are, uh, are first of all, is, is, uh, destruction, destruction of society. Uh, as economists, we have in mind, first of all, of course, uh, economic waste, right? destruction of material resources. And that's, that's a very important aspect. But it is not the, so, uh, the only aspect. Uh, it's not only, uh, the destruction does not just uh, involve uh, economic waste. It also creates the destruction of social institutions. Uh, let me just uh, uh, take again the, the case of the family. It's, it's quite obvious. Um, if we look at, at the figures, what has happened to uh, family life in uh, the United States and in Europe, that uh, we had uh, uh, very terrible consequences of uh, government intervention in this field, as can be measured by uh, divorce rates and by, by birth rates. Birth rates uh, declining, especially in Europe, uh, divorce rates being up in all countries, Europe and uh, in the United States. Uh, and that's a direct uh, consequence of government trying to, uh, uh, trying to be a social engineer of social relations. Right? All of uh, government uh, policies today are designed to uh, create, uh, well, a separate individ- individuals who uh, uh, dislocate uh, the family as, uh, as, as a form of the division of labor uh, and to uh, give economic incentives for uh, women to join uh, the workforce um, not to produce, uh, be independent, economically independent of the husband, uh, not to have any incentives to, uh, to, to give birth and so on. Another, uh, the second uh, very important uh, consequence is uh, the aspect of corruption. Uh, and here, so, uh, intellectual corruption, artistic corruption. Uh, in the sciences, this is, uh, this is very strongly um, uh, present. Um, and it, it's been a phenomenon that has been a very, for a very long time uh, observed. Uh, for example, at the beginning of the 19th century, uh, Richard Waitley, who was one of the great classical economists, uh, said, well, um, if uh, physics or chemistry had any political ap- uh, applications, the government would very strongly interfere in this area, and we would have constant uh, disagreements about these things. Uh, 200 years before, the German uh, philosopher Leibniz uh, wrote that if mathematics had the slightest political application, we would be sure that there would be debates about whether one plus one is really two. Okay, 
And well, in economics, that's always been the case that it has, uh, well, the only practical application of economics is in politics. I'm, I'm still waiting for my colleagues who want to try to get rich by, by economics. Uh, say uh, good luck. Um, uh, but so the application is in politics, and here, be, precisely because it has uh, application in politics, the government has a very strong incentive to interfere and to promote those kinds of economics, those branches of economics um, that are least harmful, uh, uh, to, uh, least uh, obstructive to government uh, activities. And that's precisely what has been going on. And government has been promoting actively lefty schools, Marxist uh, schools of thoughts. It has uh, promoted. Um, uh, mathematized uh, uh, approach that, we, uh, that economists know as uh, neoclassical economics, which uh, consists in applying uh, the methods of the natural sciences to, uh, to economic uh, uh, behavior, uh, which, in other words, treats uh, human beings as if they were stones or if they were rabbits and so on, behaved completely mechanically. And they did this because um, uh, this research is completely barren and therefore does not pose any threat, does not pose any risk of contradicting government programs. So all in all, uh, this, uh, um, the relationship between uh, uh, state and culture has therefore two aspects. On the one hand, uh, culture is a cloak, and the government needs this cloak to cover up its, what it's really about, naked power, uh, expropriation of other people. But on the other hand, it's not so that the culture remains unaffected in this process. It's precisely because the government gets into the play that also the culture gets perverted and, and depraved. And we are in the midst of this process. And the only way to stop this or to, to oppose this is, well, to, uh, uh, to focus on, on those uh, uh, fields where culture is defined. And the most important fields, again, are the sciences and the social sciences in particular. And therefore, I'm very grateful for, for the existence of the Mises Institute, uh, who promotes well, independent uh, uh, research and independent writing on, on these issues that, that are designed to well, keep up uh, levels of uh, uh, criteria of truth and falsehood that are not directly controlled by these guys. And I think, I'm very thankful for all of you to, to support our work, uh, which allows us to carry it on in the future. Thank you very much.